<laughs> okay, so welcome everybody to our, our next installment of Women Teaching Torah on Rosh Chodesh. We still don't have a better name for it. So if you have a better name, we are happy to take it. Um, we are, are joined tonight, our, our shiro tonight is being given by Miss Miriam Besson, who is well known to everybody at Shari Shemayim, well known to everybody who attends Torah in Motion, not Torah in Motion events, um, Beit Midrash Zirvantov events, um, and has heard her speak in a variety of locations and a variety of topics. Um, she was born and raised in Toronto. Uh, she's a graduate of Ulpanat Orot, and then spent a year at Midrash at Harova in the Old City. She returned to Toronto and has her BA in Religious Studies, as well as a B.Ed. In education, I don't know what else you can get a B.Ed. in. This your bio is written very funny. Um, <laughs> she is the director of student life at Ulpanat Arot, as well as a teacher. Uh, she is known uh, lovingly by them as Prof, and I guess by us as well. And with that, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Parker, and uh, thank you everyone for being here tonight. I mean, I, I don't know where else you really could be with uh, given uh, what's going on outside, but still. I guess you could be, I don't know, roasting marshmallows by the fire or something that people do when it's snowing and hot chocolate and all that. So I do appreciate that you're spending um, <laughs> with me. Um, and I'd like to thank Jonathan and, and the rest of the um, Adults Education uh, Committee for asking me way back when I almost forgot that I had agreed to this, um, I guess in the summer when they set up the, the, the list of speakers. So thank you to Jonathan and to Shir Shemaim. Um, my talk tonight, um, I'm going to... Um, to uh, dedicate on my own uh, for the um, for the merit of the um, uh, Aliyah the Neshama um, of my grandmother, her, whose your site is actually this Shabbos. So in a couple of days, um, Chai Gittel, Claire Fromer, who some of you knew um, quite well, and she was also uh, a member um, at Cherry Shemaim. So I hope that this is a. Uh, uh, this is dedicated in, in her honor and in her memory. So my topic tonight, um, I won't be singing any uh, Simon and Garfunkel, but if you saw the, the title on the, on the flyer uh, and whatnot, uh, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. So I'm going to share my screen um, just because I have some sources and I think it might be easier um, to, to, to see and read it along with me. Um, and hopefully you'll still see me maybe like on, you know, some corner of your screen. So, and then I can, you know, try to come in and out and, and feel free as we go along, we can make this interactive and you can put uh, comments and questions and things like that in the, um, in the chat. So it's been a while. I know I did this for two years when we taught, um, you know, on zoom, but it's been a while. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Um, and, uh, and, uh, let me see if, can you see this by thumbs up? Can you see the, the sheet? Awesome. All right. So here we go. Um, all right. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, as we all know, so this coming week's Parsha is Parsha Bo. Uh, and uh, what we read in this week's Parsha, among other things, um, but one of the things that we read in this week's Parsha is uh, the, the final of the, of the Esser Makot. So the last three plagues of, of the 10. And I, I, some of you know this, and some of you uh, may not know this, but I share this with my students. It's not, nothing that I came up with. So it's, I don't really get the credit, um, but I'm just going to try to, to type it in the chat. Um, but um, one second, I'm going to just so you can see, it's cool to see it in the Hebrew. Um, so Parshat Bo, I just wrote in the chat, Bet Aleph. So Bet in Gematria, it's two. And Aleph in Gematria is one. So two plus one equals three. So that's how we remember the, that the, the final three Makot are in Parshat Bo. And the first seven are in last week's Parsha, which is Parshat Ba'era, the same thing. Ba'era starts with a Vav, which is six. And then an Aleph, which is one. So six and one is seven. So in Parshat Ba'era, you have the first seven Makot. And now in Parshat Bo, which is this coming week's Parsha, you have the final three of the Makot. So I just thought that's a, a cute little, you know, mnemonic device to remember. Not that I'm quizzing you afterwards, um, but just remember the final three um, of the Makot. So I want to focus a little bit on the Makot tonight. Um, so let's look at source one together. Uh, and then... That will be our starting off point for what I really want to get into, as you can see, which focusing a little bit on the ninth, uh, the ninth plague, the plague of darkness, the plague of. Uh, so source number one, as you can see on, on the on the screen in front of you, was taken from the Haggadah. 
um, in from the Magid section. Now, it, it, it is funny because on the one hand, you know, we haven't celebrated Tu Bishvat yet. That's in a little under two weeks. But Pesach is like only 10 weeks away. So this is consider this a little bit of a, of a Pesach for Torah, something to share around your Seder table, but also a, a Parshat Hashivua. Uh, Torah. So here's from um, the from the Haggadah. Source number one, I'll do Hebrew, we'll do English. We have the time. Elu Esser Makot Karash Baruch Hu Al Hamitzrim B'Mitzrayim the Elu Heim. So these are the ten plagues. Um, and by the way, my my translation mostly isn't mine. I just copied and pasted from either Safaria or Chabad.org. So if there's a problem with the translation, we'll blame them. But I did try to put in my translation into some of the other sources. So here are the 10 Makot, the 10 plagues that God brought onto the Egyptians when we were in Egypt. And, and, the, and here they go. Elohim dam svardea, kinim arov, dever shrin, barad arbe, choshech, makat bechorot. So the 10 are blood, frogs, lice, wild animals, pestilence. That is not my translation because I don't even use that word on a daily basis. Boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and slaying of the firstborn. And then Rabbi Yehuda Hayano Tainbahem Simanim. Rabbi Yehuda uh, was accustomed to giving the plagues also mnemonics or, you know, Rashi Tevot or acronyms of Ditzach Adash Be'achav. So Ditzach are the first three. So Dam Svardei Akinim, Ditzach, Adash are the next three. And then Bi'achav are the last four. So that's how he grouped the, the plagues together. So that's our jumping off point of, of the plagues that, that Rabbi Huda puts them into groups of three. You have the first three, you have the second three, you have the last three. So is there anything with the last three? Because that's what we're that's what we're reading, that's what we read about in Parsha Bo and what we're going to read about in, in the in this week's Parsha. Is there anything that these last three have in common? that they're kind of grouped together, I mean, as a four kind of, but we'll pretend that one doesn't exist, but really the last three in this week's Parsha are grouped together. Is there something that those three have in common? And that's why they didn't, you know, make it into last week's Parsha, but they, they got cut off and they make it into this week's Parsha. So the last three of the Makot, um, Arbe, Choshech, Makot, Bechorot. So locusts, um, the darkness, and the slaying of the firstborn. So here are some psukim now that describe each of these final three Makot. And then from them, also because I bolded it, but also because you'll see it hopefully what what they have in common and really it's it's more than one uh it's more than one so uh this is taken from Shmot from this week's parsha chapter 10 Perak yud verse uh yudal uh psukim yudal tzori to tegvas vayal ha'arbe al kol eretz mitzrayim vayanach b'chol guvu mitzrayim kaved me'od lefanav lo hayachin arbe kamo v'acharav lo yechin so the locusts descended over the entire land of Egypt and they alighted within all the borders of Egypt, very severe before them. There was never such a locust plague, and after it, there will never be one like it. And then the, the, the Torah goes on to say, et ein kol ha'aretz, ha'aretz v'yochal et kol isiv ha'aretz et kol pri ha'etz asher hotir habarad v'lo notar kol yerek ba'etz uve'esiv hasadeh b'chol eretz Mizraim. So verse 15, they obscured the view of all the earth, and the earth became darkened, and they ate all the vegetarian of all the vegetation, sorry, of the earth and all the fruits of the trees, which the hail had left over. No greenery was left in the trees or in the vegetation of the fields throughout the land of Egypt. So uh, that's a little bit of a description of what the locusts, of what the plague of locusts were like. What does that have in common with the plague of darkness? So you can see already I bolded the word in Pasuk Tedvav that this plague of locusts took place in darkness. The earth became darkened. It was it was dark out in this plague. And then obviously, you know, source number three, which is what I want to focus more on tonight, is the plague of darkness. So we know that darkness has to has to be involved when we're dealing with the plague of darkness, but we'll look at it. So again, this is still chapter 10, but a little later in the chapter. Uh, and then Kav Gimel lo ra'u ish et achiv lo kamu ish mitachtav shalosh et yamim ulechol b'nei Yisrael haya or b'moshvatam. So Moshe stretched forth his hand towards the heavens, and there was thick darkness over the entire land of Egypt for three days. They did not see each other, and no one rose from his place for three days. But for all of b'nei Yisrael, there was light in their dwellings. So again, we have the locust 
taking place, that Vatechshach Kol Haaretz, we have this, which is Choshech Afela, which we'll talk about. And then finally, the last of the 10 plagues in this week's Parsha is the slaying of the firstborn. So this is two prakim later. This is Shmot, uh, we're in source number four. Um, this is Shmot Perek Yudbet, chapter 12, verse 29. Vahashem hika kol b'chor be'eretz Mitzrayim, mi b'chor paro hayoshev al kiso, ad b'chor hashvi asher b'vei tabor v'chol b'chor behema. So it came to pass, b'chatsi halayla at midnight. So again, we don't have necessarily here the, the shoresh, the root of the word chashach, like we saw with the plague of locusts or with the plague of darkness. But again, if it's midnight, I mean, it's it's pretty easy to, to guess what, what it looks like okay. outside and that it's dark. So it came to pass at midnight and the Lord smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Paro who sits on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who's in the dungeon and every firstborn animal. So what we see looking at these first three, uh, well, after source number one, so source number two, three, four, but looking at sources two through four and the final three plagues, what do they have in common? One thing that they have in common is that they all, um, took place during the night or that it was just, or the night or just dark. So the final three plagues versus the other ones that take place when it's you know bright and outside, the final three plagues take place in the dark. But do we have any other commonalities in, in either these, in either these uh, three plagues or in some of the plagues with the others? So for that, I wanna look at source number five. Um, this is the Sforno, Avadia Ben Yaakov Sforno. He lived, I think, in the 16th century, um, and he was an Italian commentator, um, very prevalent in, in the Chumash. So this is what he says. Um, he's, spe he's specifically talking here. This is his commentary um, back on last week's Parsha when it was talking about the Kinim, when it was talking about the lice. So this is what he says. Vahachet afar ha'aretz. They did not warn they Moshe. Aaron did not warn Sorry. the Haro of the advent of this plague of lice, neither, neither did they warn him before the onset of Shrin, the boils and blisters, no, nor before the darkness. So what Sephorno is pointing out, first are, what we looked at is what the last three plagues have in common. So again, the locust, the darkness, and Makapa Chorot, the slaying of the firstborn. What Sephorno now is trying to make in common is the last three of every group. So again, Dam Svardea Kinim, so Kinim is the third of their group. And then Arov Dever Shrin boils. So we've got lice. Again, Kinim is the final three of the first group. You have boils are, is the final three of the second group. And Choshech is the third of the last group. After, um, it, it's, it's the final one after, um, yeah, uh, of, of the, of, again, because we were putting Makapa Chorot aside. That's its own thing. So if you're going three, three, three of, of, of the nine, so what do those three have in common? The lice, the boils, and choshech. That's what Sforno is wanting to talk about. All three of these plagues, there was no warning. Paro didn't get any warning. God and, and through Moshe and through Aaron, it just happened. Versus the other, you know, he knew that the blood was happening. He knew the frogs were coming. He didn't know the lice was coming. He didn't know that the, the boils were coming. And he didn't know that the darkness was coming. Again, I don't know if a warning helps him or, or doesn't help him, but that's one thing that Sforno sees as a commonality between the, the, the third of each of the grouping is that they, there was no warning given to them. And then another thing that these three, the last three of each, which the Sforno doesn't say, I heard it somewhere else, I apologize, I don't know who I'm quoting, but someone uh, came up with the idea that another thing that these last three have in common is that all of those three affected the body. Lice, obviously, lice, you know, pretty itchy. Thank God, I don't think I've ever had it, but I understand that it doesn't, it's not a, a pleasant experience. Boils, again, no, I don't think I've ever had it, but uh, boils are something that affects the body. And then the choshek, which we're going to get into a little bit now, but, you know, if it says that they didn't, you know, they, they couldn't stand up or, you know, where, where they were, then their body was affected in some way from the choshek. So, so far, just to sum up before we spend more time now on the darkness as advertised by, by, my, by my title, just to sum up in this week's Parsha, we see the last three of the makot, we have the locusts, we have the darkness, and we have the slaying of the firstborn. What do those final three have in common? They all take place with Hashach. There is darkness prevalent in, in each of them, of the makot, of these three makot, um, the experience. 
And then looking through Sporno, not just these final three, but he's looking at the third in each group of the Makot leaving Makat Bechorot aside. What do they have in common? So number one, there was no warning given. They, the the Makat just happened, no warning. And number two, those three Makot of lice, boils, and darkness affected the body, right? Dever, the animals, that's, that's not the body. So those, the, these three are the ones that, that affected the body. Um, I'm going to move on now because, like I said, my title is Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. So I want to spend now the rest of our time together understanding darkness. Now, darkness, makat choshech, um, it's only three psukim, so it doesn't seem like it's, you know, a big makah in the grand scheme of things. Not a lot of airtime, if you will, that's, that's, um, that's given to it. But let's try to understand a little bit more about what this makah was all about. So I'm going to look at, uh, at Rashi, but one more time, we can just, I'll, I'll go back up to introduce us to, to the Makkah. So this is source number, uh, I believe it's source number three, um, which is again, uh, chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. So here, here we go. Moshe stretched forth his hand towards the heavens, and there was thick darkness, vayihi choshech afelach, thick darkness, a very thick darkness that, that enveloped the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see each other. No one could see each other. And no one rose from his place for three days. And for all of the children of Israel, there was light where they were in their, in their dwelling place. So a little bit, we have this understanding, darkness, it's three days, it's, 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 afela. it's like a tangible darkness, whatever that means, you know, certain sources say it was a darkness that, that you could like, that you can feel, um, whatever dark, whatever that means. But let's look at Rashi to maybe, maybe try to gain an understanding a little bit more about what this makkah was all about. So I'm going to scroll down. This is Rashi. Uh, this is source number six. Rashi um, on Pasu Kavbet. So I'll do it. Here we go in the Hebrew. Um, and you can follow along in any language of your of your choice. There was a tangible thick darkness for three days. So this is a translation again from, from Chabad.org, thick darkness in which they did not see each other for three days and another three days of darkness, twice as dark as this, so that no one rose from his place. Yoshev ein yachol la'amod. If the person was sitting, he was unable to stand. Ve'omed ein yachol shev. And if the person was standing, he was unable to sit. So this darkness if you will, it, it was like, you know, that game, like freeze. I don't know. I feel like kids just like, uh, I know my nephew just likes to put us like in like freeze and then we can unfreeze and then he freezes us and then we unfreeze and it's a game and it, it it's over as soon as it starts. So we're frozen and, you know, and it happens for a second. I feel like there was a show once where a character would freeze and then like turn to the camera, saved by the bell. Zach Morris used to freeze, I feel like, and every everybody else around him would freeze and then he would turn to the camera and talk to you. But again, those people are freezing for what, 30 seconds? It's it's not a big deal. This this is three days, meaning Rashi is saying this in total, it was six days. There was three days of darkness and then another three days, three more days of this paralysis of this frozenness where people were literally frozen in place. If you we were sitting, you couldn't stand. If you were standing, you couldn't sit. Rashi then goes on. I don't want to spend time in this, but I'll just, I'll just highlight it because people might know this, but I want to get back to the, our darkness. He highlights one of the reasons why God gave Hashach, meaning maybe every Makkah had like, you know, like a mita connected mita measure for measure. You do this. So I'm going to, I'm going to inflict you with this. So Rashi goes on to explain why there was darkness. I'll just do it on the uh, on the outside versus reading it on the on the inside. But some of you may may know this. Uh, it's Rashi quoting a midrash number one because God wanted to kill some of the Jews because they were so comfortable living in Egypt that they that they said they wanted to stay there forever. They didn't want to leave, and so God killed those Jews during the plague of darkness, but he waited for it to be dark so that the Mitzrim wouldn't see and say like, oh, so we're not the only ones getting plagues. You guys are getting plagues too. But the other reason why God, that why Rashi, according to the Midrash says that Hashem 
um, sent the plague of darkness was that during the plague of darkness, according to the Midrash, B'nai Israel used that time because again, they had light. They could see wherever they were going. They used it to go into the Mitzri homes and, um, and kind of scout because when they left Mitzrayim, they were able to leave with, with, with great wealth, just like Hashem promised to Avraham in the, in the covenant between the pieces, the Brit Bain Habitarim. So they left with, with wealth, but if they were going to turn to a Mitzri and say, I want your gold, and then the Mitzri says, I don't have any gold, they'll be like, that's funny because I saw gold in your third drawer when I went into your house uh, last week in the darkness. So they use the plague of darkness to go on their scouting mission on their fact-finding mission. Yes, I see. Um, Rose, you have a you have a hand. Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry, that was a mistake. Oh, the, oh, the hand is a mistake. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, all good, all good. So, um, so according to Rashi, that's one of the reasons why Choshech specifically, but that means that it's more of a, of a thing for B'nai Israel than for the Mitzri. So I, I just, I, I included that Rashi, that, that bottom part of the Rashi, just because it's well known. And I didn't, I guess I didn't look closely enough to, to cut it off when I was copying and pasting it. But I, some of you might know it, but I want to spend more time on the, on the beginning part of the Rashi on this thick, tangible darkness that you couldn't move from your spot and you couldn't, you know, if you were sitting, you weren't standing and, and things like that. So a question that I've seen um, that raised about this, but not, not Rashi specifically, but about this plague specifically, is there's this prevailing opinion that the Makot ascended in, in, in severity, right? So it starts off with blood. Blood's not, I mean, I'm not saying it's a picnic or a walk in the park, but in the grand scheme of things, it's a nuisance, but it's not the same as, you know, scratching your face or your, your hair off with lice. You know what I'm saying? And then if you go from lice up to boils, so lice is just, I feel like your hair, but boils your, your entire body are probably in pain. Um, and, and if we have this idea that, that all of the makot are going up in severity, then really Choshech is number nine. Does that really make sense? Was it was it that horrible that people would say that like that, that deserves number nine? Like, wouldn't you think that maybe um, the 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 hail, which was like I think like a fiery rain mix mixture, maybe that was worse. Maybe even the frogs. Like I know people who don't like insects or who don't like you know even finding one mouse uh, you know in their house. Um, you know that that that's pretty annoying. But is is darkness so so you take a, a three day nap? Like is darkness so horrible that it deserved going ninth, that, that it's the second last of the Makot. But if you if you read this Rashi and you understand this Rashi, and I think it's so interesting now, looking at this Rashi, looking at this plague, having been through the last two and a half, three years that we've been through with the pandemic, with the isolation, the social isolation, the lockdowns, I think we can all appreciate just how severe it really was. Six days, again, if we're going by the Rashi, that it's almost a full week of of not seeing another person. So six days of, of just complete isolation. Not, I mean, we assume if they were frozen in place, then they're not eating, you're not drinking, you're not going to the bathroom, you're, you're I mean, maybe you're where you are, but you're, you're, you're stuck where you are. And, and we all can appreciate just how difficult that is. And yes, that is more annoying and worse than blood and worse than frogs and worse than, than lice and, 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 and building up and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, I think we can appreciate that it's not just a physical darkness that the people of Egypt were, were struck in, struck, stricken, stricken. I'm trying to read your lips, Mr. Parker, were stricken with. But it's 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 also a spiritual darkness. It's a it's 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 a it's a mental darkness. It's it's going through what we can all go through. You know, a, a person in prison. Not that I will ever know, God willing. But I think the the, the worst thing you could do to, to an inmate is put them away from prisoners, whatever, and, and totally by themselves. Because again, with, with, with the mental anguish that that causes a person when they have no social interactions, they're completely by themselves. I think that we can understand just how bad Choshech was. And to say it better than I can say it, let's scroll um, to source number seven to put it in his words. So this is taken, and I apologize, I don't remember where I found this because I've been searching, you know, and when you get into different books and, and, and websites and then you start copying and pasting. So I don't remember, but at least I have his name so he can get the credit. This is from Rabbi Avraham Aryeh Trugman. So in psychological terms, darkness represents a sense of depression that is fed by despair and purposelessness. 
Depression causes people to feel alone as if no one cares about them and in turn leads them not to care about others. This phenomenon is quite literally described in the biblical verse, no one could see, like no one can see their brother. An even more extreme form of depression occurs when people are completely sunk in the abyss and virtually unable to move. They are stuck in a state of physical or emotional paralysis. This phenomenon is also quite literally described in the biblical verse, nor could anyone get up from his place. So according, again, to Rabbi, um, to Rabbi Trugman, this, this darkness that, that the people, that the Mitzri people uh, were faced with in, in the ninth plague was, was a, a plague again, yes, of physical darkness, but even worse than that, the, the spiritual darkness, the depression. And again, I think it's so appropriate, A, we had this connection to COVID, which I'm, I hate that we have that we have this connection now, that we understand what it's like to be frozen in place, not being able to go outside, not seeing another person for however many days on end. But this week happens to be, um, or today happens to be the Bell Let's Talk Day, when we're, where people are sharing stories of, of mental health, of mental illness, and people are sharing stories, athletes and, 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 and you know, celebrities and, and common people, you know, that mental health affects everybody. I mean, I feel like it's the celebrities that get the airtime on mental health day. There's always these like, you know, 30 minute documentaries about, I don't know, Simone Biles who had to sit out the Olympics last year because for her mental health. Um, but it, 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 it can affect anybody. And I think we, we can appreciate again, just how, um, how much awareness, thankfully, there is for mental health now, as opposed to even when I was growing up, so let's say 20, 30 years ago, how much more, how, how much more awareness there is, how much more research there is into this, and, and, and understanding just how severe depression is. It's not just like a person's like, oh yeah, they're sad, but someone who's in the, in the throes of depression will, 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 will relate to this maka, they will relate to this feeling of, they're not seeing anybody. They don't feel seen. They don't, they don't want to go out to be seen. They can't move. They can't literally get out of bed. So a person couldn't move if they were sitting, they couldn't stand. If they were standing, they couldn't sit. I think we can all, again, understand that. Or maybe we know somebody in our life who has battled that or is currently battling that. And we can be more sensitive to understanding that this is, it really is a plague. It was a plague that the meat stream got. And it's a plague that people are dealing with now. Um, I want to, but I don't want to, I don't want to, stick in in a in a dark literally and figuratively in a, in a in a dark place i want to try to bring us into the light and try to you know um lead us to something a little bit more um optimistic so i want to look at source um number eight well source number eight i guess is still on this theme before we turn it around and and hopefully or, or go to something more positive but just again to bring home that night and that darkness, there's something, there's something different about the darkness than there is in the light. So we have tefillot, which we say every day, certain tefillot that we say every day and certain tefillot that we say that, that also understand that there's something different about the darkness and how we feel in darkness, whether again, it's physical darkness or in, in, a, in a spiritual darkness, that it's different from the light. So this is from Psalms, from the book of Tehillim. We say this on Shabbat. This is um, in the Shir Shalyam of, of Shabbos, but we also say it on Friday night. And it also happens to be a song that people like to sing, you know, at Slow Shira in camp or, or whenever people are singing, maybe at a tish or something. Tov lahodot lashem ulezamer l'shimcha elyon lahagid baboker chastecha v'emunatcha baleilot. So this is, I, I don't love the trends. Again, I copied and pasted. I think this is Faria, but I don't remember. Tov lahodot lashem, it's good to praise God and to sing hymns to his name, to proclaim in the morning about all the chesed that he does, and, and, and your emuna and his emuna and your emuna in him at night. But why specifically does, does it say the chesed in the morning and the emuna at night? having amuna, having faith at night, it's because at night in the darkness, it's harder to have faith. You're scared when it's dark. Your people are vulnerable. They feel more vulnerable. You know, there's, what is that book series? Who's afraid of the dark? I'm afraid of the dark. Something about being afraid of the dark, um, I think was, was the name of a show or a TV series or, or something. I remember in Home Alone, Kevin used to be scared of going down to the basement because it was dark. And then he had these images of like the furnace was talking to him or making noise. 
There's something about the dark. There's something about the night. And that's why it's the emunat chabalilot, but but lahagid baboker chastecha, that you talk about God's chesed in the morning, but the emuna at night, because you need this extra emuna when it's dark, when it's nighttime. But I want to, like I said, so we, we, we've we talked now in, in this in this new section about the, the plague of Choshech, that it wasn't just, you know, turn off the lights for a couple of days and that's, and that's what the plague was all about. It was this tangible darkness that you can feel. It was a darkness where for three days and potentially six days, if you're going by Rashi and, and other Mifarshim, people couldn't move. They couldn't see one another. So therefore they weren't talking to one another. It was just total isolation um, for six days. And we talked about how that's really severe and can play into, um, into feelings of despair and feelings of loneliness and things that, again, we all unfortunately have now in common or you know experience with because to some extent, however many people were really social distancing or quarantining or keeping it or, or, or serious or whatever, especially in the beginning in 2020, you weren't like, I remember spending my birthday alone by myself, you know, indoors in my apartment, you know, that, that's before all the drive-by birthdays that became a fad. Um, but, you know, doing these things where you're just totally isolated and totally alone, it really can play with your, with your emotions and play and play with, with your, with your mental health. And then we tie that into now this today being mental health, uh, let's talk day, just raising the awareness that yes, it's something that is serious and it is a sickness, but thankfully we have now more research than ever and more, um, uh, you know, medication and therapy and just, and just tools to, to try and, and, and help someone who's, who's battling that, but to try to move us in, like I said, into, into a positive thing. So where can we take this? So yes, it was dark. And yes, we know now it's the winter, it's dark. You, you go, you know, you wake up, it's dark. You come home from work, it's dark. It's just, you know, seasonal effective. I, it was blue Monday, either this past Monday or the Monday before. Um, I think it was, I think it was, somebody alerted me to it. I don't remember what blue Monday is, but we know that, it, you know, the winter people tend to be, again, your emotions are, are generally down, um, especially if you have people like me on social media and you're seeing their pictures from, you know, sunny Bahamas and you're like, well, look outside, 15 centimeters. Um, so, what can we do to try to bring our, our, in our, into our own lives somebody who we know who might be experiencing darkness, whether it's a physical darkness or a spiritual darkness, like we were talking about it with, uh, with the Bell Let's Talk. So let's look at a source. This is from the Gemara, source number nine, from the Gemara in Brachot. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna go up here. This is the Gemara in Brachot. So I'll read it in Hebrew and then I'll do it in English. Tanya Rabbi Meir Omer, so what they're discussing, sorry, which we'll see, I'll go to the English first. How do we know, this is for davening purposes, how do we know when the night ends and a new day begins? So here's the machloket, here's the disagreement between how do you know exactly when the night ends and the day begins? So you can start saying what, what you need to say, your kodesh and all of that. Tanya Rabbi Meir Omer, mi sheyakir ben ze'ev l'chalev, Rabbi Akiva Omer ben chamor la'arod, v'achirim omrim, so Rabbi Meir says again, how do you distinguish? How do you know when the, the night is over and the day begins? Rabbi Meir says, the day begins when one can distinguish between two similar animals. If for an example, a wolf and a dog. Rabbi Akiva provides a different answer. And he says the day begins when there is sufficient light to distinguish between a donkey and a wild donkey. And then the last one, the achirim, the achirim say when one can see a friend from a distance of four amat, of four cubits, and recognize him. So not just that you're able to see somebody, but you're able to see somebody and, you know, put two and two together. Oh, that's my friend Joseph. And you can put two and two together. So on this source of, the, of, this, of this last part of, the, of what the achirim said about being able to recognize somebody and really see them and recognize them, I saw this on my scrolling of different sources, um, source 9b, because it's she's talking about that latter half of the Gemara. This is Dr. Rina Arshinov, and this is what she says. This does not mean only being able to see a friend at night when it's dark outside, but rather to recognize in our own difficult time, in our own darkness, that there are people who can help us. 
When we feel sad, we need to find the strength to recognize that. And by the same token, it is up to each of us to be that friend in someone else's darkness so that the per other person can recognize us as someone to support them. So her interpretation of the whole, you know, seeing somebody and recognizing them is and tying that into like we talked about the darkness and 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 the anguish and the feelings of despair and and the and the and the mental illness whether we're going through that being able to see that there are people in our lives whether it's hard to recognize that at a time but there are people we we, we have th thankfully thank god we have friends we have colleagues we have family who care for us who love us and we just need to, to look at them and we need to recognize them and we need to recognize that you know if you ask for the support if you ask for the help God willing, they'll be there for you. And on this flip side, on the same token, if you know someone in your life, especially at this time of year, when things are dark and people might just be feeling and it's cold and you're, like I said, you're going to work in the dark and you're coming to home, uh, coming home in the dark for you to, you know, have those opportunities to reach out and just say, Hey, checking in, seeing how your winter's going, see how everything is doing and being that friend for someone else. So that maybe they didn't recognize that they have someone in their life to help them, but by checking in on them and, and, and asking how they're doing, you can offer that same support. Um, so I think that that's my, my, my positive takeaway for all of us that yes, darkness, it was a plague that deserved to go number nine because it really was so severe that we can all relate to now having gone through some form of darkness in our own lives in the last two and a half, three years, but also knowing that we don't have to go through this alone if somebody is going, in fact, going through this because there are people, friends, community members, um, shul members, family who are willing to help. But on the same token, it, it behooves all of us to remember that, you know, somebody who might you, you, you might assume they're doing totally fine because they always are fine, but you know what? Sending a check-in message every once in a while never hurt anybody. So they'll just, you'll just say, hey, I'm checking in. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Or they'll say, you know what? I'm actually not doing so great. Oh, do you want to talk about it? And great. You just opened up a conversation. So I think having that opportunity and having this knowledge, especially on Bell Let's Talk Day and even at our two schools, uh, Mr. Parker and I, we have wellness week in, in general, this whole week, we're, we're focusing on different physical wellness and spiritual wellness and, 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 and emotional wellness, just giving, giving our, our students the tools and, and giving us the tools and knowing that there is support, there is help out there. And we just need to, you know, try to take the first step to, 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 ask for it. And on the flip side, you know, offer to be that help to somebody else. So um, I, I've been neglecting the chat. I, I see that there are messages. I don't know if there's, um, oh, oh, solitary confinement. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you, Shana. That was what I was looking for. Solitary confinement. That was the word from, 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 from before. Um, um, yeah. So I don't know if anybody has any questions, but that was what I wanted to focus on specifically on the darkness and then a little bit on, you know, how the plagues, what they had in common. So um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to answer. Um, and if not, I'll I guess just jump in yeah, and, yes, and break the awkward because that's what I'm good at is undoing awkward. Um, usually it's the opposite. Usually I just make things more awkward like I am right now. Um, no, thank you so much. I think this was, like, I've never thought of it that way. I always, I think, was taught and got stuck on the classical Rashi that you brought in, where it was this, like, palpable darkness. And I, like, I guess it's the little kid in me always thought about, like, what does it mean to, like, be stuck and feel the darkness? Um, but I really like your, I think, your more contemporary understanding of it, and especially the connection you made to the pandemic and the lockdowns, about how we can all connect to that um, personally, in a way that forever people really couldn't unless they were in solitary confinement. Um, I also really like, I, kn I know you didn't really get back to it, but I really liked your connection to, to Simon and Garfunkel. I thought like it, it's a very, I, it's a very clever connection. Mrs. Andler, my grade eight English teacher, loved this song and she made us break it down all the time, like a really unnecessary amount. Uh, but just like it comes up again and again in the song, right, that there are the people there, they're talking and they're not actually speaking, they're hearing, but they're not actually listening. Um, and I think that's really apropos to what you were talking about there, like how often do we hear somebody saying words to us, but we don't actually listen to the undertones of what they're saying. Um, so yeah, thank you. I thought, I thought this was like you, the way you tied all those things together was amazing. Thank you.
maybe next time we'll do like a case study of, of different of lyrics, lyrics and how they tie into and how they tie into different uh, verses or, or whatever. So you're signing up for SIVA. That's what I'm Oh, hearing. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> we'll see if I'm invited back. But no, again, thank you everybody for taking the time, like I said, to, to join me to join me tonight. Um, and again, if you are on social media, I don't remember what how Bell does this, but like I feel like if you send a text using a, if you're on a, if you're a Bell um, subscriber, I think five cents goes to mental health, or if you share certain images on social media, they donate. So keep doing that until midnight, and, and look, keep raising money um, for this important um, for the important work that they do um, for mental health and for awareness and things like that. Thank you so Thank much. You so and much, if Karen. anybody is interested in in speaking at Sivan, please let me or beyond. Please let me know. Could I ask a quick question? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I just was wondering, uh, where can I get the notes that you use for this class? Oh, I can, um, uh, should I send it to me? How does it, should I send it to Maytal and she can send it out or how? Yeah, if you send it to Maytal, she can probably link it to when she uploads this video, she can probably put it all together. Okay, so I'll do, I'll do that. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks everyone again for joining. I really appreciate it. Happy Thanks Rosh Hashanah. A happy belated Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> yes, a class. Great, great job. Thank you, Shane. I really appreciate it. It was really good. Thank you. Mrs. Rifkin, nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Number one Red Sox fan. I don't know, but okay. We let her on. I wasn't controlling the chat. I wasn't controlling the the you know, letting in and stuff, but okay. It's not baseball season yet, so it's allowed. <laughs> no rivalry yet. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Parker. And I know Rabbi Taylor will be speaking at nine o'clock. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.